Hello everyone, welcome back. It's Space Engineers Plus Me, episode 18. I'm Enigmius, and today we're beginning phase two of the build for our massive atmospheric mining vessel with support aircraft. I put a merge block in the ground-based unit, and now we're just adding the second merge block that will interface with it so that we can connect the airborne segment to the ground segment and then treat the ground segment as though it's an airborne vehicle or detach them and move the airborne segment somewhere else. It's kind of uh, optional what we can do with it when they're detached, but it was just an idea that I had to have um, basically the ground-based vehicle and then a secondary vehicle that could come around and pick it up and move it around. I thought that would be kind of neat. Along with that, we need a connector so that we can transfer cargo between the ground-based unit and the air-based unit whenever they're connected. It wouldn't work with just the connector. We've learned that if we run out of power, with a pair of connectors, they detach. We don't want that to happen. So we've got the merge block, um, keeping everything hopefully nice and secure. And then we've got the connector that's doing its own thing. It may or may not be connected. We still need to maintain power to the whole thing, but I feel better with merge blocks than connectors. Maybe I should just look up how much power each one uses and use that as my excuse. Regardless, one of the very, very important things that I wanted to make sure of when I had these two units that would be connecting to the ground unit is that I'd be able to see the merge block and the connector for the uh, airborne segment very, very clearly. I don't want it flush with the surface of the chassis. I want it extended just a little bit, as you can see it is now using these um, smaller slope blocks so that when it comes time to align them and bring them together, it's a lot easier than having everything flush and trying to figure out where everything is. We're also going to have a spotlight that's going to help illuminate the area around these things. So then when it comes time to, to dock, basically, it's a lot easier than uh, we could otherwise make it for ourselves if we had kind of just ignored the entire process. Now, the airborne unit is going to be uh, kind of like a utility sort of thing. I don't want just basically a collection of thrusters that moves things around. It would be nice if the airborne unit had some functionality of its own. And when it comes to determining what that functionality might be, there were certain things that really stood out as uh, more valuable than others. One would be additional storage. If we happen to be having a very successful mining run, uh, being able to transfer some of the, the loot, so to speak, to another vessel and then either deliver that to the base independently or just have it there stored, just more storage on site. Very attractive option. The other thing that I wanted uh, potentially was um, additional processing and refining because we can, we can do iron, nickel, and cobalt on the ground unit with the art furnaces that we built into it, but we can't do... Uh, any of the other minerals that we might be able to dig up. So things like uranium, for example, finding uranium in the field, we wouldn't be able to refine that into ingots to use to power our reactors. We would have to take it back to our base and refine it there. So we may add a couple of refineries to the airborne chassis just so that we can do a little bit of refining of things other than the basic three. More importantly, depending on how things go, I would like to have uh, some hydrogen storage on board and potentially some oxygen storage, but oxygen doesn't really do us any good on a planet. The oxygen storage is only useful if we take it into space and then we want to have the ability to refill our suits oxygen and also refill oxygen tanks. That would be a benefit, but it's kind of one of the things we would probably add in after the fact if that's what we wanted to do. But one of the things that was really neat about this whole setup with the airborne unit is that we get to put a little bit more attention into the aesthetic detailing, making things look a little bit more interesting and kind of, I don't want to call it a guide, but it's definitely something that people can take a look at if they're looking for new ideas in, in terms of what they're doing and what they want things to look like uh, relative to what they get in between. There's a lot of things that you can do with a voxel setup like this with the blocks that were given in terms of the different shapes that you can put together. Um, the different lines that you can get out of those shapes when you put them together in particular orders and things like that. There's a lot of people that basically convince themselves that they're no good at building and so they stop trying when the whole idea is that we mess around with different shapes and we put them together when we find things that we like and find things that we don't like and along the way we get a little bit better at bringing our own 
visions in our mind into reality because one, our visions are more closely matching what's capable with the blocks we're given and also we, we have the confidence to sit down and try and make it happen whereas, you know, people build rectangles because they don't think they can build anything else and it's it's unfortunate, really, I'm not trying to be critical of these people and saying that there's something bad about them, I'm saying it's unfortunate that they give themselves the short end of the stick and refuse to kind of expand on their existing skill set because they're afraid that if they try, they're going to fail, and failing would be worse than learning a little bit that would bring them closer to what they want to do. It's just about experimenting, giving yourself permission to experiment, mess around, find the things you like, and then build on those, and over time, you'll find yourself uh, having a much easier time putting things together in ways that are interesting to you. Now, one of the things I also wanted, very, very important, rather than using batteries on either of these vehicles, really, was to have the airborne section with its own nuclear reactor. So we've got a nuclear reactor in the ground section, we've got a nuclear reactor in the air section, and as long as I've got inventory um, for uranium, which both of them have the, the very large cargo containers, I don't think a few kilograms of uranium is going to be a difficult thing to, to smuggle on board. We should be able to keep our ships going for the, the kind of the longer expeditions that we might want to go on. Right now, I'm looking at the little red wagon, our little cargo helper, and it's basically got fuel in the batteries to keep it going for 45 minutes to an hour when they're full, which is not bad if you're just going out to one location and then parking the ship, turning everything off, doing what you're going to do, then hopping back in the ship and turning everything on and, and flying back to base. That's, you know, 45 minutes to an hour is plenty. But when we're talking about going on long expeditions to explore, to find new lakes to dig in is basically what it's going to amount to on the planet. Uh, we want to be able to provide ourselves with as much fuel as possible. So that's one thing to keep in mind was um, how we were going to do that practically and reasonably and solar panels and batteries was just not it. Also in looking into the whole situation, finding out that um, if you're using uranium in reactors to charge up batteries, it's very, very wasteful in terms of the amount of power that gets converted over. There's You only store like 80% of the power you're producing, which was kind of a, a discouraging find. So one of the things uh, we came across with the reactor, we made enough reactor components for two reactors, but I forgot we also needed the superconductor conduits which require gold, which we found, we've actually got a source of gold that we already started digging out, but we didn't dig out enough to make the superconductor conduits for the whole thing. So we're back to our frozen lake. This is the first frozen lake that we found. We've still got all kinds of stuff we can dig out of it. But most importantly for this expedition, we needed the gold. We needed to get down there and everything that we've been doing down here on the lake uh, ever since the lemon drop crashed, has been manual and I don't necessarily mind because we're not after things like iron here where we need vast amounts of it. That's one of the things that I'm looking forward to, getting a large ship into place that we can mine vast amounts of minerals in one go is that we can get things like iron much, much faster than we currently can. But for things like gold, we just dug down through the ice, down <laughs> through the stone, down through more stone, and then around the corner into some more stone before we found the gold. And I was a little bit concerned when I first found this deposit of the gold that it was going to be just this tiny little thing that was going to barely yield enough gold to do anything with. It actually goes quite a ways. It goes quite a ways indeed. So we brought it back, we processed, processed it, we got the super conduit, super conductor conduits made, finished off the reactor, and now we're thinking about the first atmospheric thrusters that are going to go on this vessel. Primarily, I was in a building kind of mood. I didn't really feel like doing too much technical. I just kind of wanted to put things together and see uh, how they might look. And also, I wanted to show off the size of these thrusters in case you missed it in a previous episode because these things are absolutely massive. Just like everything else that we've been building. The reactor is massive, the storage containers are massive. But to really appreciate the size of this thing and how it's going to kind of look when we start putting even more thrusters on it. We, we, we had to get some thrusters into play. So 
Uh, one of the, the criteria that I've kind of set for myself with storage containers is I wanted to make sure that there was external access to the containers uh, from as many places as possible. I don't want to put myself in a position where it's difficult to get to the contents of the storage containers because I only left myself with one access point and I can't get to it because I was almost out of fuel on my jetpack and I could only get halfway up the side of the vehicle. Uh, there's endless number of reasons why. <laughs> You could find yourself not able to get to where you want to go, usually involving fuel and a jetpack, but it was just easier from, to kind of approach it from the beginning that we're going to have lots of access points for the containers. And then rather than putting the thrusters right up to the backs of the containers, I decided that we would have these little sort of claw systems. They're, they're static. They're not going to be connected to pistons or rotors or anything like that. They're just going to be kind of sitting there holding the engines away from the chassis so we can get to the, the cargo containers and we can also have uh, great big huge engines connected to this chassis. It's massive. These things are just absolutely gigantic. They take so many motors that I've actually had to go and do another mining trip for iron just so that I can make more motors so that I can finish the thrusters and I'm going to have to make at least one more trip to get even more iron to make more motors to finish all the thrusters that are going to be on this vehicle because one thing we've learned, it's one thing to have enough thrusters to get the vehicle around when it's empty, it's another thing when it's full if you don't have enough thrusters things tend to not want to move. We've got three of the super jumbo storage containers on the airborne unit plus a, th a fourth on the ground unit in the unlikely event that all four should ever be full we need to make sure that we have enough thrusters to accommodate that three large atmospheric thrusters giving us forward movement i think is going to be plenty no matter what we happen to have on board the the thrusters providing us with lift I think are going to be a complete other issue. So again, this is mostly cosmetic detailing. We could have just built all the way around these things with cubes. It would have been functional. It would have been quick. It would have cost a little bit more in terms of steel plates to make all of the different blocks. But realistically, I wouldn't have been happy with it because it would have been a great big rectangle around thrusters. And that's, we, we can do better. We know we can do better, even if it doesn't work out the way that we want it to on the first try. Or one of the things that I find a lot when I'm doing the aesthetic parts of a build is that I'll build something and then I'll log out of the game and I'll come back the next day or two or three days later, whenever it happens to be, and say, you know what, that looked good when I made it, but I've got an even better idea now. We could make some adjustments and things end up being even better than we originally anticipated. That's part of the process is just giving ourselves, first of all, freedom to experiment and then freedom to change things later on. There's no reason why we have to keep things the same if we think we've got a, a better idea. Worst case scenario, you make a backup of your save before you start making changes, and if you don't like the new ideas, then you can revert it quickly and easily. But in our case, w w any changes we make usually end up sticking. That's just one of the things. It's just a question of getting all of the different angles to come together. Where is it kind of leading the eye? What kind of spaces is it creating? A lot of the interest I found looking even at other people's builds is can you see through the vessel at various different points? Is there kind of an interesting thing going on there? Is it all like 90 and 45 degree angles with maybe some more intricate details, just as details, just little things here and there? Or is it ma really making use of the blocks that are available to us to kind of draw that interest out? It's not just cubes and, and 45 degree angles. We can do some really interesting things with what we're given. So a lot of experimentation, but in this case, it's we're, we're really getting down to the nitty gritty in terms of materials, and especially, especially when we start putting in the the lift thrusters. The lift thrusters are going to be the large atmospheric thrusters. The side to side and reverse thrusters are going to be maneuvering thrusters, uh, both to save on materials and also to reflect the fact that we don't necessarily need uh, a tremendous amount of thrust for maneuvering thrusters. The more we have, the more the more maneuverable the craft will be. I guess that makes sense because maneuvering thrusters, but it's, it's worth pointing out that if you really want a maneuverable, agile kind of craft, um, gyroscopes and maneuvering thrusters are very, very important. In this case, this thing, in terms of atmospheric vehicles, is just so large. You're happy if it flies up and stays in the air on its own when you've got the dampeners turned on and you're able to maneuver it into position to dock with whatever you need to dock it with at any given time. That's good. That's, that's all we're hoping for out of this behemoth. So the next episode, 
we're going to put the framework into place for the atmospheric lift thrusters, the ones that are going to basically be pushing down to give the vehicle lift. What I want to do is make it so that they extend sort of around the ground unit, above it, but also around the sides with an opening at the front so that we don't have to lower the airborne unit down over the ring that's holding the drills. We can approach from behind and above and just kind of settle into place with a big opening and a lot of room to maneuver so that we can hopefully avoid some of the more uh, disastrous outcomes that come from trying to maneuver things close together, especially at night, but you never know. And we'll do some more cosmetic detailing on the, the main section of the chassis as well. Once I decide if I want to put a couple of refineries on there or not, then we can close it all up. We'll get a cockpit on there, we'll get the frame for the engines, and maybe one more episode after that to finish off with the maneuvering thrusters and do the final adjustments to the chassis, and then we should be testing it on our ice lake, assuming we can get there, because there's kind of a distance between here and there, and just digging is, is sort of the afterthought of this whole process. So if you want to be notified when I add future videos in this build series and other series, you can always subscribe to my channel or follow me on social media links for social media in the information box below the video. Feel free to leave your comments and feedback. Thanks for watching guys and take care.